Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Um, are you are you driving? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm parked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I'm like, is this girl going to be able to multitask and talk and drive at the same time? So I, I did figure it out. Yeah, rest there. <laughs> Definitely. So I, before I get started, um, um, podcast, here, podcast here. Uh, so how do you, I was really worried about saying your name wrong. Is it Jenna or how do you say it? Yeah, Jenna. Yeah. Okay. It's just, yeah. Like okay. Time. Right on. Right on. Uh, how was training? Yeah, it was good. It's really hot here at the moment. So it was scorching and I was sweating like crazy, but it's good. It's good to be able to, um, I'm on kind of like holiday back to like my hometown and on the Gold Coast so I'm spending a lot of time with my mom and stuff so it's good to be able to train at the same time as like enjoying holiday right nice and so are you still in Sydney um no I live in Sydney but I'm like currently visiting um in Queensland there's a place called the Gold Coast and that's where I grew up that's where I did my school and everything so yeah I'm visiting back there now right on right on Heard your accent i i gotta ask though uh before we get started here do you do you like when you're going over for fights and things like that do you ever get people to come up to you and be like they hear your accent and they're like oh you're from england or does that <laughs> yeah something random yeah like yeah england or i was in the uk and they all thought i was like an alien when i was over there because like obviously the australian accent's a little bit different but then when i go to the u.s sometimes they think yeah it's like english or something and i'm like no not even close but <laughs> okay well and it's funny uh i mean you you got israel yeah probably a huge star over where you're you're at um and i remember like the first time i ever heard him speak and i thought like just with uh i think there's a guy leon edwards and sound kind of similar they had the same kind of accent i was like is this guy from england and i looked up and he was like from like new zealand or something I'm like whoa jesus <laughs> completely so, different yeah definitely but uh like i said thanks for uh taking the podcast here um i uh, i know you're kind of in the car so i i i, I yes. it's not i'm not in, putting you in any inconvenience at any means so. No, it's good because um, it's just like when I come here, I have to drop my mom off because obviously I share her car. So it's just like we went to training and I dropped her off at work. But now is a perfect time. I'm not really doing anything for the next few hours. So it's mm-hmm. good. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, before I even get started, let's uh, let's take you back to the beginning here. So what uh, what got you into MMA in the first place? um I was doing karate at the time like um generally as a kid I like did pretty much every single sport possible like I tried everything um I'm an only child so my mom just was kind of constantly trying to keep me busy and and give me something to do outside of school so um I kind of was trying everything and I started in karate I enjoyed it um and I got my black belt and everything and I was doing that for like three and a half years or so um but it just wasn't maybe as challenging as I would have preferred so I ended up um, transitioning over to, I kind of like stumbled upon MMA at the time. Um, My mom was working around the corner from a gym um, and we tried it out and then literally just kind of fell in love with it from there and just kept doing it. And once I finished school, obviously wanted to compete and and really give it a go as more of a career. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I know I did notice that you have the karate background. So, um, so what, like I I took uh, Shotokan. So what, what kind of karate were you in? Yeah, the same, Shotokan as well, um, here in Australia, so maybe it was a little bit westernized, but yeah, still Shotokan originated well, from I love the fact that, you know, we could talk about Shotokan all day, but what I love about every kind of fighting style is that, um, you know, you go to different different Jodos, or go to different uh, uh, okay. dojos, sorry, uh, <laughs> and uh, mix up my words today. Um, you, go, you go to different jo- dojos and every kind of style is a little bit different because every teacher every since they will teach everything so much differently so like I would go to a, a, um, one in Windsor and I was doing something totally wrong I'm like and I'm like I'm probably a brown belt I had no voice saying oh you guys are doing it wrong the sensei's like standing right there so <laughs> yeah it's hard it changes a little bit like and I think that's kind of like one of the other reasons that I left just because it didn't feel like it was like as like 
I guess, governed kind of thing, as per se, or just, like, genuine and consistent as, like, some other things. And, like, especially, like, now that I do jujitsu, um, I definitely see, like, with jujitsu, if, like, if you know the lineage of maybe a gym or, or a practitioner, um, like, it's kind of easier to understand, like, what kind of style you're going to get, like, if it's Machado or if it's Gracie or whatever you're kind of after. It's sort of, like, a little bit more relatable in a sense, I think, like, or, like, just a little bit like better quality yeah and and i think that's a problem with a lot of dojo or with a lot of um different uh i guess mixed martial arts like i mean you go to some karate like they call it karate or they call it um uh taekwondo, uh, taekwondo. you go there and it's not authentic if that's a word it seems to mm-hmm. be uh like they they call it like they'll give it some weird kind of name and you come in there and the kids are doing like some kind of some bullshit fighting it's like karate <laughs> exactly and, you know it, i guess if you watch a lot of these uh a lot of videos and you on youtube and stuff like you'll see people doing things and it's like that does nothing for you or like they'll yeah. push out of the way and they're like that's that's self-defense i'm like no it's not <laughs> i'm sorry exactly. and it's like for that reason it's kind of like hard to like I guess, yeah, keep it consistent, keep it authentic. And it's like anyone can open a gym and teach all sorts of stuff that isn't beneficial at all, which is sad because martial arts is so positive and it can kind of be tainted. And, like, for sure, like, there's a lot of jiu there's maybe, like, a few jiu-jitsu gyms out there that are kind of doing the same thing, maybe aren't as qualified as they should be or aren't as good a quality as jiu-jitsu sort of generally is. But, but yeah, it's I just felt like karate was just, like, not really for me and I needed to sort of transition to something a little bit like more challenging at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, now I do kind of want to kind of tra- uh, quickly transition into, uh, into your uh, last fight. Uh, so, I mean, you got your hand raised, but I mean, crazy fight from top to bottom. So can you kind of talk, talk me through that fight? I mean, what was, what was your feelings going into that, into that third round? Yeah, it was, it was, it was good to be able to experience every aspect. Like sometimes I guess you're doing a fight and you're like, maybe I would have liked to show more of my striking or vice versa. And so, I mean, to be honest, like the game plan didn't go to plan at all. Like Mm -hmm. what I expected to kind of happen didn't really happen. And I wanted to keep it on the feet. I wanted like as much as my, I'd been working a lot of my cage wrestling, but I didn't necessarily want to stay there for as long as I kind of did during the fight. Um, but the positive thing is that since I was working all these aspects, then um, at least we were prepared for everything that kind of happened. And and I guess like my maturity sort of pushed me through at the end of each round to kind of come up on top or end in a good position or whatever it was, just to ensure that I was sort of up on the scorecards. But all in all, like it was obviously a very physically demanding fight too. So I'm glad that my gas tank held up. Um, a few times in my last couple of fights it hasn't and therefore it's really let me down and to be able to portray like my proper potential and my skill set so um, it was like chaos being the best kind of way and it with like the best kind of opponent someone who's sort of a, another solid all-rounder and um, I felt that Jesse sort of was able to push me in every aspect which was really good. And I think that's a really good thing about yeah, and I think that's a really good thing about fighting veterans is that you sometimes you need to to kind of know like what a veteran can do to push you to your limits. I think. Yeah, definitely, and like, yeah, obviously she was more experienced and stuff, so it was good to be able to prove to myself that I can hang, kind of with a jujitsu black belt that's obviously as experienced as she was and was ranked number seven. And that kind of thing. So, yeah, it was awesome to kind of come out on top and know that everything that we've been working on has all kind of come together well. And, and mm-hmm. I got to be able to show it in, in that performance. Yeah. And, and I think I watched another interview of yours and you talked about uh, Feiner and you said and you mentioned again that she was like number seven ranked. So are you talking about like in the world or like because I know Bellator doesn't truly have rankings uh, as I've been told by other Bellator fighters. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's world ranking. So that's what I got told by an oh. interviewer after our fight. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. that oh, and it was on, um, I think it was Dan Hooker also put it on his podcast as well that she was ranked number seven. And I was like, okay. these are all like things that I didn't know myself until afterwards because I try obviously to pay attention to my opponent, but not 
you know, dwell too deep in where it's going to become like an overload of information. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, these are all kind of like now that the fight's over, I can definitely have a look at the, I guess, statistics of how um, how much of an underdog I was and that kind of thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. cool. So I mean, beating the number rank, do you kind of see yourself itching closer and closer to the gold? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely one of those divisions and I guess most female divisions it's sort of like three or four wins and you're already sort of on your way towards that title shot and especially like you're saying um Bellator doesn't really have ranking so therefore mm -hmm. um that contention spot is clarified by like mainly streaks and stuff like that I guess obviously it is the caliber of opponent but it sort of changes up a little bit and um if you're on like two or three wins and you're in the right direction fighting the right people then yeah definitely very close to the title yeah and I noticed uh, Bellator does that a lot with uh with a lot of fighters so you know you have your champion and you don't really have rankings but you'll have someone that'll go on like a couple streaks and then they get to the shot of the title i know like in your weight class um with cyborg and uh, uh who'd she just be arlene um i i will never get her last name but i think same yeah, yeah as you are and uh and yeah i mean like with her she was like you know on the i never understood the rankings there i'm like how are people ranked this in the because i never i wasn't big on watching bellator but i've been doing the last year and i'm like where the hell are the rankings <laughs> and yeah. She had the, the three fight win streak. Oh, okay. So that's kind of where I think that's where they're kind of going at. Like if you're getting a lot of those, if you're rocking in those wins, they tend to maybe give you that title shot or not, but. Yeah, definitely. And it obviously depends who you fought and mm. the guys that she fought kind of made a, a big difference. And yeah, it was like, it made her like, she was definitely like, there was no if spots or maybe that she was the clear contender, but it's just sort of like without the rankings, it's hard to, keep everyone else on board unless they're following her career or unless they're following each fight or everyone's individual fights and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a little bit harder just to clarify, like, like she was definitely deserving. So it was just like sort of showing people, okay, these are the people that she beat just to catch everyone up. Mm -hmm. There's no rankings as we say, like there's no number two or number three next to her name, but for this reason, like these, this is why she's there. And obviously she's fought for the title in the past. So there was really no one else more deserving than her. But it's sort of hard to, yeah, by clarify that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I did want to. I think I kind of went off a little bit off track here, but uh, going back with your your last fight. So you know, you get your win. Um, you know, you. So obviously, they have the COVID protocols and stuff. So um, I don't know how how much different it is from other organizations that are currently putting on shows. Um, mm. with, with Bellator so how does that how does it work out you know you go what you go back to your hotel room or do you just fly right out of there how does that all work out yeah so um, I flew into Boston um, and then just because those, those were the flights that were kind of available and then we went um, straight to the Mohegan Sun the venue mm -hmm. um, I luckily got there a little bit earlier so I had a day to sort of roam around there was no sort of restrictions really other than um, don't go into the restaurants, don't go into the shops and stuff and interact too much with the general public just in case you get contaminated and therefore contract COVID. Um, and then on the Saturday morning, um, we got tested. And then for that whole day, we have to quarantine within the hotel room. So you spend the whole day mm. in there. And then um, basically the test results come back usually by the end of the day or like by that night and then the next day you're free to roam around the venue again and go to your workout areas and that kind of thing um but every morning we have to check in and do a temperature check and a questionnaire just to ensure that we're not feeling any symptoms and we're not obviously like harboring a high temperature or a fever or anything like that so um we got to like luckily for me I was like a day earlier so we kind of got to get to our workout area and and kind of hang around the venue a little bit more probably than other people which is good but I did have more travel so Changes yeah things. yeah definitely now obviously with fire you got to cut all that weight in that fight week so it, 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 having that having those extra you know demands having people having to take your temperature every day and doing all the COVID tests and just and then having your weight weight cut on top of it um now i don't i'm not too sure how much uh, if if you do much of a weight cut or not um you fight that at a uh, featherweight but uh like with with just in general do, do you find that's a bit of a like just an extra annoyance or like just 
more of a demand or how, how did you kind of take it? Yeah, I mean, like the biggest thing is sitting in your hotel room. Like obviously you're very restricted into how many calories you can burn, yeah. like what kind of exercises you can do. And on top of that, like it's not only wake up, but it's fight week. So you want to keep constantly staying on top of your skills and like just for your own mental state, I think just constantly working as per se. So um, <clears throat> I know like I know a lot of people struggled. I'm like lucky in a sense that I don't I don't do big weight cuts for 145. Mm-hmm. I kind of did at the beginning, like when I so this is like my fifth fight in Bellator at, at featherweight. Um, mm-hmm. My first couple I was doing like maybe two kilos or so. And now I kind of wake up on weight. So um, it's just sort of like my body getting used to the weight cuts, um, working with my dietitian that I have now, Geordie, the fight dietitian who does most of the Australian, New Zealand top level guys, Israel, Sanya, all these people. So that's really helped out on the way of like education and stuff. And I think just getting like less intimidated by weight cuts and stuff and, and not kind of getting like stressed out that we're still stuck in a hotel room all day and that kind of thing like the the temperature checks and stuff are fine like at least we had workout areas we had bikes and treadmills and stuff there for us we weren't allowed allowed to go into the gym that was at the Mohegan Sun um, because obviously that's open to the public as well so that's another kind of common area that we can't share as per se but it was just more like the days that we did spend in the hotel room like for me, I was just sitting there like, oh, how, like how much, how many calories can I really burn in this hotel room? Like mm. when it's really only like maybe 10 meters squared, not even like, so it's, it's a little bit, um, that kind of does play on your mind. I think a lot of people did struggle with that, but I'm lucky enough that I don't really cut that much. And worst case, if I didn't lose anything that day, then I could have made it up during the end of the week. And it wouldn't have really, it would have been the difference of waking up one way or waking up like 500, 600 grams over. So it's really not that challenging which is lucky but i'm sure a lot of people struggled those guys that do maybe like five or six kilos or whatever it is like three or four pounds um in the day that's probably a lot harder for them yeah yeah and and i know like with other fighters about the whole idea and besides covid but the whole idea about training for fights and then there's a difference between training for your fight and training for your weight cut and Mm. i think the reason why i mean not is it not just the weight cut affecting the fight, but because it's affecting your mental game. And I think it's affecting that you're so like some fighters are so worried about, I got to make that weight because of course, I don't know how it works in Bellator, but um, in other organizations, you give up so much of your purse to the, to your opponent, if you miss weight. So like they got that in their mind, they are all, they're not even set on their opponent. They're set on, Oh shit, I can make this weight. And then I get to focus on the fight. Whereas fighters like yourself, you're, you're already dialed in, you're focused and ready to go. So I like, do you think there's a little bit of the truth to that? Yeah, definitely. And I think like for that reason, I get asked sometimes every now and again, if I would like, if, built or up in the bantamweight division or if i moved over to the ufc if i would fight at bantamweight and like yeah it's definitely attainable um so obviously it's an option but just because it's attainable doesn't mean it's the best option and currently right now i'm really enjoying this um developmental stage of like getting the experience and mm-hmm. being able to um like just basically totally concentrate on training and and getting my skill set and levels up um rather than worrying about cutting weight because for bantam weight that's basically all i do is just worry about the weight worry about counting calories worry about how many calories i'm burning do extra cardio sessions and stuff these kinds of things just to kind of be a little bit more comfortable and not have to do as much water weight um so for that reason like i do feel like it's kind of like better on my mental because as an athlete, all of us, obviously, as athletes, most likely are very competitive. And um, to spend time away from your actual sport, you're also like wanting to constantly level up on on these things. And sometimes the weight cut can take away from that and therefore affect your mental state because you're not mm. necessarily working as much as somebody else maybe or you're not like leveling up as much as and progressing as much as maybe you'd like to see and I think like for me that makes a big difference into my mental because I like I constantly want to be working and I feel like if I'm spending hours of my day running or biking or rowing or whatever it is just to burn calories that's really taking away from my training and I think um, going into the fights 
um, it will kind of take away from my performance in a sense because I'm sort of just like um, a li little bit doubtful of the fact that I didn't do as much jiu-jitsu. I didn't know as much striking. I, I was really just worrying about the weight cut. So it's definitely something that I'm very grateful for and it's something that I've sort of consciously decided to prioritize because I feel like it does make a big difference so so yeah for that reason it's sort of like positive for me to stay at 145 and and keep concentrating on the performances mm -hmm. yeah and and that's, that's good to hear I do kind of want to move forward though um, we could talk about cutting and fighters not making weight I mean it's a common thing like UFC last night I don't know if you saw like three fights were off the card I don't think it was weight cut issues but just in general, you could we talk about that all day, but uh, let, let's talk about your, you know, your very uh, short amateur career. Uh, I mean, you didn't have much uh, to, uh, to go at amateur. What, what was the reason for that? Um, I just didn't have any opponents. Like um, it was just sort of, unfortunately, this was maybe like five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. The Australian scene just wasn't as booming as it is now. And even the New Zealand scene, because I remember we were trying to get fights in New Zealand and, Obviously, being an amateur, it's a little bit harder. If you're trying to get overseas fights as an amateur, it's near impossible because you don't really have that much pull. You're not getting paid and you're not really valuable enough to be able to sell tickets and these kinds of things. So um, it's sort of definitely changed things. I like I spent probably, I think, after one of my, after my last amateur fight, I spent nearly a year off not on purpose, just constantly trying to get opponents, trying to get opportunities and trying to get any promotion to sort of find somebody for me to fight between like certain weights. Like, like I fought at catch weight and amateur and I fought at 65 and amateur and I was a lot skinnier and a lot less dense then. So 65, I was basically walking around at like 68, 69 and, um, and then like fighting. Yeah. Not really that much lighter. So, so these kinds of things like, it was, it's obviously not the best way. Like I would have loved to get way more amateur fights and love to get the experience. But once the opportunity came to turn pro, I was like, well, there's a, a couple more opponents at that weight class and in the pro division. So, so hopefully it'll just give me more opportunities and therefore sort of force my hand to, to go pro. But um, all in all, like I think the positive thing is now that I feel like as another international fighter in Australia, I've sort of increased the popularity of MMA between the female population here. And I feel like me, Arlene, Megan, Jessie Jess, all these like Australian girls have been really positive in, um, in helping push the popularity and therefore more people are getting involved and therefore people that come after me will have hopefully more amateur fights and be able to get that experience that they need to be able to go overseas or get prepared for their pro debuts and stuff. Yeah, it, like, and it's interesting you bring up the whole idea about New Zealand, us, you know, Australia, you know, that region there. Um, at that time, when you were starting to fight, did you did you know how big that the sport was going to be in that area, or did you did you, did you do it for that reason, or how do you feel about it at the time? Yeah, not at all, to be honest. Like when I started fighting women when in the UFC, Strike Force had closed down. Um, Invicta or being brought over. Invicta had was still running, but it wasn't necessarily like super popular and there wasn't a lot of money in no, Invicta. At the time. And I mean, I think Bellator had only just started to kind of have females, but again the, the divisions weren't very dense and they weren't kind of um, as overpopulated as they are now. Um, I really didn't know kind of it was like somewhat of a gamble I guess like I I loved MMA and I loved the sport so obviously I wanted to do it because it was giving me that fire in my belly so it was sort of just like hopefully if I keep pushing out this thing and then eventually it'll open up and then obviously progressively through the years of of fighting and everything um more opportunities opened up women started getting into the UFC and now it's just a big thing we've got PFL we've got um LFA we've got all these other options kind of as per se for Australian and like any female fighters um, to kind of do really well in the sport. So it's, it's really good now, but at the time I had no idea what I was sort of getting into and I just sort of hoped for the best. Yeah. And, and, and talking about that, um, you know, you being in Bellator, where would you like to see Bellator um, open up more in? Like, I mean, we got, you know, they have the U S and then they have the Bellator Europe. Would you like to see them 
um, bring it more to Australia region? Would you like to see them bring it more like where I think um, I know organizations are really focusing on China right now and Russia. So where would you like to see the Bellator go? Yeah, I would 100% love for them to come to Australia and even New Zealand. I think um, we've got three, all up three New Zealanders, um, including myself, because I consider myself as a Kiwi because I still have a New Zealand passport in the Bellator roster. So I think that's really positive. Obviously, there's Arlene, there's Beck Rawlings. Um, mm-hmm. We've got a couple of Australians in there and hopefully we can start developing more. And I keep saying like any sort of like, if you have a show here anywhere, like whether it's Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Gold Coast, Perth, even Adelaide, all these spots that the UFC have kind of been, I think it'll be awesome to like get like, I think the venues will sell out and I think it'll be really positive and like just building that kind of demographic over here. Because I mean, I am over here and I say to someone like someone be like, what do you do or whatever it is or who do you fight for? And I'll be like Bellator and they won't necessarily always know what that is. Where, as in you go to the US and obviously it's such a big promotion over there um, in comparison and sort of just like I would love for that popularity to really move over to the Australasian scene and and for these guys to sort of um, make it a little bit easier for it to watch in Australia too. Like right now it's it's very hard to watch a lot of the apps and pay-per-view options for Bellator are restricted to this region and, mm-hmm. and therefore it makes it hard to kind of build and get that support. Um, but slowly but surely I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they will kind of take it as an option i i think if they took the gamble they would be surprised how many people would actually end up coming to a show and and how well of a production they could kind of put on in somewhere like australia yeah well i remember in um which which card was it it was in ufc um i think when um uh what's his name uh the reaper i'm trying to think of his name oh jesus oh. rob Whitaker. Whitaker, yeah <laughs> Fought, I think he fought. He fought Romero in in Brisbane, maybe. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Some, it was. I think it was maybe Adelaide or somewhere. Right yeah, something. Yeah, I was somewhere around there, and the fan base. It was unbelievable how engaging they are. I mean, you know, you watch any event, where, where, whatever organization it is, and you watch the fans. You, fans get crazy, but like the fans there in Australia, it was just insane. Like I, I go there more and, 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 and the fans are really what makes it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Even like the most recent Melbourne card with um, Rob Whitaker and Israel Adesanya, obviously those are like two guys that are based over here in this end of the world. So it was just really cool to sell out the stadium again. It was the Marvel stadium. It's such a, a phenomenal facility. So it was one, a great production two sold out and three, just the atmosphere was insane. Cause the fans over here um, go crazy. Like, yeah, we have a, a lower population than somewhere like the U S or something, but we're still selling out like pretty much most UFC events. So if you could take that kind of demographic and, and start moving it towards someone like Bellator as well, that would be awesome. And I think it will get received really well. And, and not just with the fans, but with fighters too. Um, really picking up a lot of good names. Not to say that they're not in uh, from regional uh, places, but but like they've taken a lot of good. I mean, you look in your division in featherweight, uh, Chris Cyborg. I mean, she signed uh, what a year ago, maybe maybe just over a year ago. A bit more, yeah. And I think she's really brought a lot to the division. I mean, there's a lot of girls that. That want that want her title. I mean, they want a piece of her. They they know that she's beatable. So um, it's good to see what Bellator is doing for sure. And I really enjoy. It. I like the fact that I, I you know I you know that Bellator that you know they don't you're not waiting forever to watch a fight. Like they just they want they just skip all the bullshit and then it's like okay let's put the fight on let's go you know. So it's uh, I I like I do enjoy watching Bellator. It's nice to kind of get another uh, watching another promotion and seeing what they do. Um, I think so too. Yeah. But, um, um, shift and focus back on you here. So, I mean, you're 26 years old now and in a interview, you kind of talked about how like you're, you're, you felt like you're entering your prime. So do you feel like, like, are you talking like fighting prime? Like, how do you, can you elaborate on that? Um, it's funny. I feel like it's everything. Like I'm in a really transitional phase at the moment. I'm going through a lot of 
changes sort of in my personal life and then in my athlete life as well like with COVID and everything I ended up changing gyms in a sense just because some closed down some moved away like things really like shifted for me and I think for that reason um, the people that I've brought on board now for my training and everything have been so positive they align a lot more with um, my wants and needs and my mentality around MMA and and what my goals are going to be ultimately And for that reason, um, I also kind of have the foundations of my experience and the opponents that I fought. Um, Like I said, this is my fifth fight in Bellator right now. So I'm finally sort of hitting that place where I'm a little bit more comfortable here. And I'm I'm not necessarily learning on the job anymore. I'm doing my thing like this is sort of like exactly what I need to do. And things are a lot easier to express. And and these little kind of like niggles, like when I had my Bellator debut, I do feel like I was sort of a little bit shocked. I was a little bit under pressure. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I literally, like, the biggest fight I'd had was in a small hall in Hong Kong, like, and all the rest were on the Australian local scene, which are great productions, but definitely nowhere near as big as someone like Bellator in the SAP Centre, like, obviously internationally streamed and all these kinds of things, as much as they're not massive hindrances or anything like that, it's just sort of, like, the pressure nobody like can prepare you for that pressure and prepare you for what to expect and I think a lot of a lot of Australian and New Zealand people have gone over and and had that exact same experience I mean we just had Chelsea Hackett recently fight on the contender series and she basically word for word said exactly what I felt when I had my debut on Bellator that it was almost like an out-of-body experience you're not really in control you're not making any conscious decisions you're just kind of watching everything happen which is exactly not what you want to do in like one of your biggest opportunities of your life but it's just like how it happens like you can't really expect what's gonna happen you can't really prepare yourself I think sometimes like you can like I tried all week I was like yeah everything's fine this is exactly where I need to be everything's normal I'm enjoying this I'm just like enjoying the journey blah 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 and all the media and all these extra things and then I kind of got to the actual performance itself and it sort of like stunned me in a sense and so I do feel like now finally I have my mindset under control I have my like I guess for lack of a better word, pre-fight rituals and just the little things that I understand a little bit better because I've got the experience behind me now and I've fought those tough guys and I've challenged myself and I've been in different positions. I've gone to the, I've had first round knockouts, but I've also gone the distance. Like I, I have a lot of cage time behind me that has really kind of developed me into the confident athlete I am now to be able to back myself in every performance, like go up against jujitsu black belts and have zero like doubt that I'm, I'm going to come up up on top, even if it's on the ground, even if we go to the ground, I wasn't afraid of these positions and stuff because these are things that I've done. Like I'm an MMA fighter. And, and just because maybe someone will be like a judo black belt or a jiu-jitsu black belt or a phenomenal striker or whatever it is, I'm an MMA fighter and, and I have the performances to prove that. And I think I'm at a really good spot in my life where I, like I said as well like understand my weight cuts so well and wake like my last two fights I've woken up on weight it's been really low stress I've been able to enjoy the travel and and kind of take that in my stride it hasn't affected my performances or my jet lag or anything like that and I think all these things have sort of added up and now I'm just in a perfect spot to kind of hit those momentum and keep going forward and get that title and and go from there so so it's kind of like it's hard to explain but it just feels like everything's shifting but in a really positive way and and my mindset especially has made a massive difference so you kind of find like you feel like everything's kind of coming together for you now yeah it's taken a little while and I mean I am 26 so obviously I didn't necessarily have that like personal maturity um I feel like I am very mature person and I'm a very independent person but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can prepare for these things like you just I mean like I've done a lot at 26 years of age and sometimes I need to take two seconds to kind of step away and like really look at that and appreciate that but at the same time I think now at 26 my life experiences, my personal experiences, my athlete experiences and, and experiences that I have in career and travel and everything. These are all things that have created sort of, I, I, I feel the best foundation for a champion and, and, and for the athlete that I want to be and want to become. So it's really good. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so 
Uh, I think you talked in one of your post-fight uh, interviews. You know, you said that uh, you do. You, you're planning, or you, your plans are to return in uh, 2021, um, sometime in 2021. Is that still the plan, or are you still open to anything last minute in December, or are you are you pretty uh, confident that you want to come back in 2021? I'm pretty set on the like around about February time frame, um, just because I know um, we've got Bellator next. Oh, this weekend? Yeah. yeah. So it's this week. I don't even know what day it is now because I've been traveling so much. So I'm like, is it Monday? Um, yeah. So I know that, yeah, Alima Lai McFarlane versus Velasquez. Mm-hmm. Such a great card. Um, but that'll probably be the last one for 2020 because um, they've really like smashed out the four in a row. The Mohegan had a little break and now I've got this one. And that's pretty much it. So it's not like I'm expecting any last minutes just because of the fact there's not a lot of shows locked in. Um, but so I'm really aiming towards that February time frame. I would like to get back in there as soon as possible just to keep the momentum going, obviously make up for lost time with COVID and everything and and fighting someone like Leah and, and, and that kind of thing. These are all things that I guess we were prepared to do this time um, or in like May ish. So if we can kind of get back to that and get everything back on track, that'd be awesome. And I'll just sort of take it in my stride. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when, when you do return, um, do you have anybody in, in mind? I mean, you beat the seven, you beat the seven, uh, number seven ranked uh, contender. Um, you know, you have some good names in there. You know, you got Joey Bud. Um, you know, you got Arlene, of course, who who just lost uh, Cyborg. I mean, then there's Cyborg as well. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, who, who who you got your sights on next? Um, yeah, I definitely. I want to um, re um, live that match up with Liam McCourt that we had in May. Obviously, we were meant to fight in London, and then COVID hit and everything. And then, unfortunately, she got a surgery, so mm-hmm. she's been off for a little bit. <clears throat> but I know that she wants to honor that match up. I want to honor that matchup. I think it's a great matchup for me and it would be a great fight to sort of kickstart 2021. Um, she's got a lot of momentum herself at the moment. So I think it's sort of like two rising people that are in a good like stage in our, in this featherweight division um, that can fight each other and sort of just like, yeah, obviously whoever prevails will sort of move forward and onto those Julia Budd names and Kat Zingano and uh, like even Leslie Smith and all these people I would rematch um amanda bell like there's so many options but i think for now leas it makes the most amount of sense and then we can kind of go from there okay and uh, let's just talk about the champ for a second so um chris cyborg obviously you know it's um you know she's been shown to be beaten um she's had a crazy streak um you know she got her first loss in a long time a couple uh, a couple years ago um uh Gosh, uh, Amanda Nunes had had knocked her out. So, I mean, with a, a, a fighter who she is, how dominant she is, what do you find, like, what do you think the secret is? If, and not to spoil anything, but what would be the secret to beat her? I think, um, I think for one, like, not getting intimidated by someone like Chris Seibold. Obviously, that's easier said than done, and I'm not saying I'm, like, some overconfident person or anything, but I think, like, establishing the fact that she is beatable and she's just another person. Like I think for a long, long time, she was sitting on that top perch. And then for that reason, a lot of people that were fighting her were afraid of her power and were afraid to kind of like stand up with her and all these sort of things. And therefore maybe didn't perform to their full potential or didn't even really show their full potential. And I think um, for me, like I've always been the underdog. These are not like things that I'm unfamiliar with. Chris Cyborg would just be another person that I would be another underdog for and she would be a lot more experienced than me and obviously have accomplished more. But in the way of skill set and mindset, she's just another person. And and for me, it's it's just another obstacle to overcome. So I think um, I think I personally would prefer like keeping on the feet. I'm a lo- little bit longer than her. Like all these little statistical kind of um, stylistic differences I think would match up really well for me and then on top of that just not kind of overthinking things and and just like that's exactly where I want to be and she's just the person that's holding the belt and that's my belt like so that's I think the the mindset you have to have because it was never going to be easy even if I was fighting for the belt with Julia Bard or Arlene or whoever had the belt it was never going to be easy so now it's just Chris Cyborg is that person and will possibly be that person when I go 
for a title shot. So therefore, it's just another roadblock in in the way, and it's just another obstacle to overcome. Yeah, and, and this, um, you know, not to you know really <clears throat> put the spot, but who do you think uh, probably deserves the next shot? I think it's hard. Um, I was thinking about this the other day, just because, like I said, Arlene was really the only clear contender. Um, <clears throat> Cause she, everyone else had sort of like one, one, lost one, 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 lost one, or wasn't as directly mm-hmm. sort of on their own streak. I mean, I would expect just with the way the division is going, someone like Kat Zingano will probably end up in that position. Um, Someone like Leslie Smith as well will probably end up towards there. She's obviously fought the right people as much as she did lose to Arlene. She sort of fought the right people to sort of move forward. Um, I mean, someone like, unfortunately, Amanda Bell lost. So it's, it's like this weird, like, triangle. is like this person's lost to this one, but they beat this person and then vice versa. And it's just like trying to figure out, like, a clear contender is a little bit harder because it was a lot easier. Obviously, Arlene was that that guy and now, now she, like, unfortunately lost. It's sort of like finding a replacement. So I do think, like, the Leslie Smith and Captain Garner probably will be the next people in line just because it makes probably the most sense. Well, and I know that... Chris had fought Leslie Smith uh, prior. And I mean, it was like, a, it was, I, I had never seen anybody get hit like that. Like just how, like there was maybe a minute in the fight and I felt so bad for, her. Um, I think personally, I think Katz and Gano could throw some issues with her because Kat can take a hit. And I mean, everybody says, Oh, they can take a hit until they get someone that proves them wrong. But I mean, yeah. she's really tough. Um, and she's got the experience just as much as uh, uh, Chris. So it, I think it'd be a really, uh, it'd be an interesting matchup. I mean, if she got a hold of her and used her strength, and even if she can't do damage, just wear her down. Um, and I know that's probably been the game plan with a lot of girls with Cyborg is to hold her down, tire her out a little bit, tire her arms out. But I mean, I mean, she's shown that she's got great cardio. So I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I wish I could just say, yeah, this is how 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 you girls are gonna beat her. But <laughs> I just can't. Yeah. I I don't know what to do. <laughs> There's different options. I mean, like, but I think the the main thing is, yeah, not letting her intimidate you, and then not letting her bully you, especially in the stand up, and then just problem solving. Like, yeah, you could you could take her down. You could tie her up on the cage and take her down. Like, I mean, that could even be an option for me because my cage wrestling has got so much better and my top control is obviously quite good, like from my last performance and in other performances as well. So I was like, like, I mean, there's so many different options, but I guess like once the opportunity arises and, and whereabouts she sort of is in her career, it'll, we'll make that decision and my team will sort of come up with the best. But, um, I think the main thing really is to just not get intimidated. Someone like Kensingano is super talented. She so showed so much maturity in that last fight. Um, I think she was very smart about her game plan. It wasn't, I mean, the most exciting fight or anything, but it doesn't really matter that much. And um, and then, yeah, and therefore, like, her Muay Thai skills and, like, her experience will definitely sort of be a really great matchup either way. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I don't want to take a too much more of your time here so i do I do again want to say thank you for coming on the podcast and doing this interview with me i appreciate it i know i screwed up at the time i do apologize for right. that. It's changes sure. uh, uh, <laughs> i've had so many cancellations and and re like and and then new interviews coming up so i do apologize <laughs> it's all good no problem at all well, you have, you have a great day and uh, your bright future for 2021 and good luck with uh, your upcoming fight. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me.